we are manufacturing in America. Every day we create, we design, we craft, we work. We are the pulse of the economy. We are the backbone of America. And the NAM represents us all. And thanks for joining us for another Creators Wanted. I'm your host, Aaron Smalls, and today we're talking with our sponsor, Stanley Black & Decker. Today's event is Amplifying the Power of Small, a design thinking session on amplifying the impact of SMEs in 21st century manufacturing. To kick things off, I'm going to introduce the NAM president and CEO, Jay Timmons. Well, thank you so much, Aaron. And it's great that everyone's joining us here today. We appreciate you being here. And you know, we're here because all of us want to be a part of Manufacturing 4.0, a fourth industrial revolution in manufacturing powered by digital and smart technology. There's literally no business that can't benefit from tapping into digital transformation. And today's event is about demonstrating that keeping your business state of the art on the cutting edge is truly easier than you think. And it's about showing how technology helps people. It creates jobs, it keeps our teams safe, and it makes them more productive. Now, in this past year, we saw that small and mid-sized manufacturers that embraced manufacturing 4.0 early, well, they were better prepared for the disruption of COVID-19. And I'm reminded of Hire Robotics, a company that specializes in robotics for hire, providing automation solutions for manufacturers. Although Hire Robotics design teams are based in different parts of the country and, and actually all across the world, they had no trouble collaborating on design work remotely thanks to an early investment in cloud-based CAD technology. The NAM and the Manufacturing Institute, we're here to help. We're here to help with these kinds of advances. And we launched Creators Wanted to help speed up that transformation because getting to the next stage of modern manufacturing requires a new generation of manufacturing employees, employees with diverse backgrounds and skills. Now, I'd like to thank Stanley Black and Decker for their sponsorship and for their involvement in this effort. They've truly been leaders throughout this transformation, and they've been helping with small and mid-sized manufacturers to be able to reap the full benefits of this digital age. So I'd like to welcome the Stanley Black and Decker CEO, Jim Lurie, and Jim is going to talk more about his company's involvement in these efforts. Jim, take it away. Thank you, Jay. We are pleased to be partnering with you on Creators Wanted and very pleased to be co-hosting this important event on advanced manufacturing. And welcome to all of you participating today in this design thinking session. Dating back to our founding, small and medium manufacturing companies have been key partners of Stanley Black & Decker. Many of the participants today come from areas of specific importance to Connecticut's economy, like aerospace and defense, among others, and often are suppliers to other Connecticut companies as well. So thanks to all of you for being part of today's discussion. We are pleased to be longtime partners with the National Association of Manufacturers, or NAM. In fact, our membership in NAM goes back as far as our records go, well back into the 1800s. Today, our partnership with NAM is critical to one of our key priorities, to bring back more manufacturing and increase manufacturing jobs in the US. Connecticut is an important focus area. 
NAM is a key partner of ours in making sure that public policy and public-private partnerships address workforce development, supply chain continuity, sustainability, and other determinants of manufacturing growth in our country. Our history in Connecticut goes back to 1843 when we were founded just down the street in New Britain. One of Frederick Stanley's original manufacturing sites was known as the Manufactory. And today we are doing this event in our 21st century Manufactory, which we opened in Hartford in 2018 as a symbol of our commitment to Connecticut's economic growth. And today we still make tape measures in downtown New Britain, automatic doors in Farmington, engineered fasteners in Danbury, and aerospace components in Manchester. But this manufactory is a forward-looking site. It is a place that is supporting our adoption of Industry 4.0, and we invite you, each of you on the call today, to make it a part of your Industry 4.0 manufacturing initiatives. The Creators Wanted campaign comes at a critical time for American manufacturing, for the country, and for our US workers, both present and future. And as every one of us strives to put the health challenges of the pandemic in the rear view mirror, we all have a responsibility to assist with the economic recovery that must follow. Manufacturing must and will play a critical role and we can supercharge it right here in Connecticut. So thank you, Jay, for organizing this campaign at the very moment that our country needs it the most. We have so many employed people in need of upskilling and so many unemployed people who need jobs. A jobs-led recovery will be a manufacturing-led one, and the widespread and pervasive adoption of Industry 4.0 will be a key factor in that process, especially among our small and medium business community. So we hope that this event will set the stage for how, together, here in Connecticut, we can help to achieve that transformation and set the course for a strong manufacturing-led recovery. Let me emphasize a few points about how important and timely this is. Manufacturing jobs create excellent opportunities for people, young and in career alike at this critical moment when many people previously in service related jobs were displaced due to the pandemic. People looking for new careers can find them in manufacturing provided they have access to the right skill development. And let me emphasize on this final day of International Women's Month that women have been disproportionately hard hit by the pandemic and that these jobs and opportunities are well-suited and accessible to women looking for a way to re-enter the workforce. And as we consider the importance of Industry 4.0, think of it as a propulsion into the 21st century for a new age of U.S. manufacturing. It will undoubtedly be a stabilizing force for dealing with the volatility, uncertainty, and complexity that society will continue to face in the 2020s and beyond. And one key element here is the human aspect. Change can be difficult, but there are ways that businesses can support and facilitate it, making the move from the old manual ways to new technology and data-driven methods. Here in Connecticut, with the support and help of the state, as well as four-year schools, our tech institutions, nonprofits, and fellow corporates, we are launching a new digital skills credentialing program that will make it easier for employees and prospects to acquire skills to build their careers in manufacturing in the 21st century. And now I'd like to introduce one of the great governors of our country, a leader who has skillfully and successfully guided our state through the COVID crisis over the last year. He is a leader who understands that we want to increase taxpayers and not taxes in this state, a champion of economic development and a staunch supporter of manufacturing in Connecticut, Governor Ned Lamont. He has unleashed his team with an array of leaders from both the public and private sectors to harness the Connecticut ecosystem to address workforce opportunities. I'm pleased to call him a friend and an ally, and I'm honored to be a member of the Governor's Workforce Council, in which we are coordinating action on work, workforce development and driving impactful changes in that area here in Connecticut. So with that, Governor Lamont, over to you. All right, Jim, thank you. And Jay and everybody else, appreciate the chance. Let me just pick up where Jim left off. Um, Let's say our economy had a bit of a pause, a COVID-related pause for a while, but um, I think you're going about to see this economy take off like a rocket ship, and uh, manufacturing is going to be leading the way. Here in Connecticut, we have amazing manufacturers like uh, Stanley Black & Decker. Um, 
you know, back when you helped start it up with a Mr. Stanley in 1843, Jim, uh, thank God we're not doing everything the same way. You've got to continue to innovate. And uh, that's what we're doing here with, um, you know, 4.0. And Jay, frankly, I'm trying to get state government just into 2.0. It's a little bit more of a push to stay, uh, stay competitive. But let me tell you, I would consider this next year an extraordinary opportunity as we um, change the way we do business in state government and what we do in manufacturing. Uh, you know, as Jim mentioned, um, we're going to be doing a lot of certificate programs. I really need um, the manufacturing community, Jay, working with NAM, to uh, make sure that young people understand what advanced manufacturing is in the 21st century. And um, we've got a fair amount of education funding coming from the federal government. We'd like to work with you to make sure that um, manufacturing gets reintroduced to um, uh, the next generation of workers. Uh, Jim mentioned the certificate program. We're gonna be rolling out a whole variety of certificate programs. You know, you don't necessarily need two years of four years of college, sometimes an 18 or 24 week certificate program, working closely with uh, Stanley Black and Decker, other amazing manufacturers. We're in a position to help fund that and make sure that um, you get the workforce you need going forward. And um, Jim, I got to thank you. You're on the, our workforce council every day. We're working with our manufacturers and other businesses, trying to get a better sense of what they need in terms of a workforce, because that's one of our jobs as governors. I mean, uh, we don't have oil and natural gas here in Connecticut. We've always had a pretty darn good workforce, and I got to make sure um, they stay competitive in the 21st century. I know our manufacturing czar, um, Colin Cooper, is going to be on a little bit later, so feel free to ask him really tough questions. But um, with that, Jay, I want to say thank you for what you do, uh, National Association of Manufacturers. It makes an enormous difference. I think uh, we're the Silicon Valley of manufacturing here in the state, but you got to uh, work really hard to stay ahead of the competition. And this program is allowing us to do that. Thank you so much to Jay and Jim and Governor Lamont for uh, those incredible insights there. Now, I'd like to welcome Sudi Bangalore, CTO of Global Operations at Stanley Black & Decker, as we dive in to our very first panel. Thank you, uh, Jay, Jim, and Governor Lamont for your comments and for framing this really important opportunity. My name is Sudhi Bangalore, and I am the Chief Technology Officer at Stanley Black & Decker Operations. And I have to say that this is a great privilege to be part of this important discussion around the power of digital transformation of SMEs. Picking up on Governor Lamont's key points, we at Stanley Black & Decker have engaged on a full-scale innovation and transformation program that at its core unlocks value by bringing people technology together in enabled new ways of working. And it also are, is creating new career paths for our workforce. A critical component of this transformation has been an ecosystem that we've stood up from scratch and one that is made up of small and big companies, including startups, academics, and institutes, institutes like ARM. We, along with many of the industry, recognize that fostering and engaging on this ecosystem is the only way to tap into this rapidly evolving landscape of technology, and equally important, engaging on the passion uh, and the interests of around the topic of upskilling and retraining of people and therefore talent. The good news is this, as Governor Lamont mentioned, this ecosystem has already been created in Connecticut for the most part with organizations like the CBIA, CONSTEP, CT Next, and the manufacturing czar with Colin Cooper. We now have the opportunity to lean in on this organization and the ecosystem that has, that has already been set up and start leveraging the structure to drive a significant scale up of impact that we can have in Connecticut with, with the thousands of SMEs that's already there in Connecticut with varying levels of transformation on their own. With ecosystems as a topic of discussion, I will be starting this panel discussion around the potential of SMEs and partnerships with Francisco Betty, 
who heads the Advanced Manufacturing Program at the World Economic Forum, and Christy Pentema, who serves as the President and CEO of the Connecticut Business and Industry Association. With that, I'm going to now start the discussion around framing the opportunity for SMEs, uh, as I mentioned before. So with that, Francisco, how would you frame the SME opportunity that you're seeing worldwide? Well, Sudi, first of all, many thanks for, for hosting me today. I'm very excited about the, the conversation we are having and, and indeed SMEs are a priority. Maybe to frame the opportunity, a, a first important point to mention is that SMEs, depending on the country, represent in between 98 to 99% of the manufacturing ecosystem. So the majority of companies in manufacturing are today small and medium-sized enterprises. Uh, and what I would like to highlight is that, for example, think about the number of you know, tier one, two, three suppliers that you are engaging in and with. And I think that what is exciting is that more and more we are realizing that digital transformation, it's a supply chain game and play. To succeed in their digital transformation journeys, large companies need to bring on board with them their suppliers and the broader ecosystem or of, of SMEs and innovators in which they, they operate. And we are seeing that happening more and more. So that's definitely good news. However, there are some clear challenges that all SMEs are facing today and that require far, further attention and, and highlight the importance for public-private collaboration to support some of the efforts that SME are, are taking and embarking on. Maybe just to name a few, and, and we'll take the conversation forward later on, but just to name a few, I think a very one a key priority is the need to address the skills gap that we have today in manufacturing that is really affecting small and medium-sized enterprises. And also, they need to upgrade their workforce in terms of skills and new capabilities that are required to deal with the technologies that advanced manufacturing and digital transformation require. Maybe a second point that I would like to highlight is the need to, or for SMEs, to develop new strategies. I think that we have seen many SMEs having access to technology, but very often a big pain point is the lack of a clear and long-term strategy on how to adopt and leverage those technologies. And, and to move beyond the opportunistic approach that has been taken in many, in many cases. And then the first point maybe to, to conclude, it's the need to think about the digital, let's say, architecture and the process architecture that is required for different technologies to be interoperable, to play together and to be able to transform at scale. Can you, picking up on some of the points you just made, elaborate a little bit more on what's driving this increased focus around SMEs, uh, it seems like worldwide. So it would, would be great if you can share a few thoughts on that. Absolutely, Sudhi. And, and one of the, the points I made before, you know, I mentioned it's a, it's a supply chain game and played. Why? Because we need to transform value chains end to end. And that requires becoming everyone in your supply network and ecosystem on board in the digital transformation journey. And we want to transform end to end because that's how companies are developing new products and creating new customer experiences, right? And that's, and that's going to be a major driver of growth in the, in the years ahead. But also, I think that through digital transformation, SMEs can drive efficiency improvements, reduce costs, and improve productivity. That remains one of the key challenges that we have in manufacturing today. And the very good news, or at least what we see as good news, is that there are many new solutions and technologies that are available and that are, that are helping, let's say, democratize the access to digital transformation. Maybe just to share a few, a few examples to make this more tangible. Just look at the, the amount of new software solutions and interfaces that are available and that are simplifying the life of operators and that can be customized to the needs of different companies of different sizes. I think that's, that's brand new and it's really bringing and driving a revolution on the shop floor and SMEs can definitely benefit from that. Maybe the other example is that we are seeing more and more SMEs becoming extremely innovative and leveraging even commercial technologies 
we we saw some companies using commercial uh, let's say watches to get real time alerts and, and data from their equipment in order to monitor performance improve quality and operation so i think the message here is that there are tons of new solutions they are affordable and that's what is making the new opportunity for smes extremely exciting and maybe the final point Sudi, to conclude on this is that you know when it comes to the to the, the conversations on new shore and reshore and resiliency across supply chain and value chains well it will require the reinforcements the strengthenings of the sme ecosystem and networks and 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 that will require i believe a strength and collaboration going forward in between MNCs, OEMs, governments, and the broader ecosystems in which they, they operate and that they partner with. Excellent. Thank you, Francisco. I think the point you make about uh, leveraging existing commercial technology, special purposing it to suit the needs of SMEs, be it from a cost standpoint, be it from a time to deploy standpoint and trainability standpoint are all critical points. And that's a wonderful example of how we can accomplish all of those um, and very quickly start demonstrating value. Thank you. We'll come back to you um, uh, after I pose a question to Chris on that topic. Chris, uh, you and I have you've spoken before. You come from a, a very relevant background as an SME yourself, and now you're the president of CBIA. And so how would you uh, describe, uh, or how, uh, let me put it this way, how does your background coming from technology and transformation around SME shaping uh, the belief that you have around the SME transformation that you're trying to drive in Connecticut? Yes, Sudi, thanks for, thanks for having me. Uh, my background is very relevant. Um, I, I've sat in the seat of the SME. Uh, so I, I got involved in the manufacturing community in 2002 uh, when I joined my family's manufacturing company, about 50 people were employed there at the time. And prior to that, I had worked as an attorney. So I knew nothing about manufacturing. Um, and I got engaged in the business. And of course, early on, when you're trying to learn about something new, you reach out to those folks who are closest to you. So I, I reached out primarily to the people internal in the organization to learn about manufacturing, learn about the opportunities for the company and for the employees. But that business, uh, being a relatively small business, um, really wasn't embraced in the Seneca ecosystem at the time. So I started to attend various meetings, whether they were CBIA meetings or my local chamber of commerce or various trade associations, connecting myself with other manufacturers, connecting myself with the government. And wow, I found this Connecticut ecosystem that was just fantastic uh, and tremendous, from education to government programs to people in the private sector sharing best practices with each other to the organizations like CBIA and our affiliates concept and Ready TT. And that really gave me uh, the education, the manufacturing education, as well as the education about how to run the business. And so it literally transformed me as an individual. And as a result of that, um, I became quite honestly a lot more successful personally, but the organization and my employees became a lot more successful. We started to embrace the full ecosystem. We realized that in order to grow our company, in order to grow the individuals from a knowledge point of view, from an income point of view, from a success point of view, we had to embrace uh, those outside of our four walls. And so I, I used to say, you know, uh, it takes a village to raise a child. It also takes a village to raise a successful uh, small medium-sized manufacturer. And as a result of that, as a result of embracing what was out there in the ecosystem, the various programs, the best practice opportunities with other manufacturers, like Stanley Black and Decker, large ones, medium manufacturers, and small ones, um, it made us a more successful company. We tripled our revenue, we tripled our uh, employment, uh, and eventually we became a, an attractive small organization to a big $7 billion publicly traded company. And, uh, and I sold, sold the company, but stayed on, stayed engaged in the ecosystem, uh, and happy to be, continue to be engaged in that ecosystem at CBIA. Wow, that's an imp impressive story. So uh, how, how would you now bring uh, all of that experiences and, and your passion around this topic and, and drive uh, the next level of momentum with what, what uh, you've started in Connecticut? 
well, personally, I offer myself, you know, like I said, I've sat in that chair. So if there's an SME that has a question about the ecosystem or industry 4.0 or opportunities for an SME, you know, I, I've gone through this transformational journey, as I mentioned, certainly I offer my personal experience, my trials and tribulations and opportunities like we just discussed. CBIA and our affiliates concept and ready CT, we're, we're here to provide the education for the SMEs. The, the education about what the Connecticut ecosystem is all about. It's, it is a big ecosystem and therefore somewhat complex with lots of opportunities. And so we're here to educate the SMEs about how do you navigate through the ecosystem? What parts of the ecosystem will help you grow your business? What parts of the ecosystem will help you optimize your bottom line with process improvements and efficiencies and continuous improvement? Um, and so we want to help the SMEs tap into those tremendous resources. In addition, very specifically, Concept, our affiliate, has boots on the ground. We work with manufacturers every day uh, as a local manufacturing extension partnership to grow their top line and optimize their bottom line. So we are in the manufacturers, literally inside of their facilities, even during this somewhat virtual environment. So in coordination with NAM and, and Stanley Black & Decker, Concept will be offering assessments uh, to in manufacturers around industry 4.0 needs and opportunities what does that mean for their workforce? Um, and th these opportunities will be from the very basic level of Industry 4.0 to the most advanced and everything in between. So we will literally be there uh, for the SMEs and we will be taking the lead. Awesome, thank you so much. So uh, we'll, be, we'll be getting into some of the details of purposeful technology, uh, training, upskilling, and of course partnerships all in, in the coming sections of this program. But I, I want to add, uh, at least conclude this section by asking a question to Francisco on the care and scale program or the philosophy of WEP. So can you briefly describe that whole philosophy, Francisco? The reason why I'm asking this question is uh, we have embraced that wholeheartedly with an SPD uh, to drive uh, impact with our own suppliers. We're starting out small. We have 10 companies that we've selected, suppliers of ours, uh, to basically take our passion, the commitment and the investment we've made with uh, technology and people, et cetera. And Karl Marx, who will be actually picking up this segment uh, is driving that program. So I would love for you to, uh, to frame that opportunity at a global scale. The reason being, I think it's so critical to, to have this philosophy and care and scale because that's really the only way as I started off in the segment uh, that we can drive the step change. So I would love for you to, uh, to provide that perspective from that standpoint on the care and scale. Absolutely, Sudhi. And, and let me be build on, on, on something that Chris just mentioned before, which was uh, the need for assessments and benchmarking. I think that one of the, the main challenges is that many SMEs don't really know where they stand in their digital transformation journey. And they are not sure at the very beginning of the journey. I mean, we are seeing a lot of SMEs that because they, they have a, a, a smaller size, you know, they are more agile and they are able to innovate at speed. You know, the, the example we mentioned before about SMEs using commercial smart watches to get real-time alerts from, from, from their equipment, their machines, it's a, it's a great example, right? But, but I think that, however, you know, that, that benchmarking is exercise, it's essential for SMEs, disregarding on where they're standing this journey, to develop you know, the roadmaps that are required to accelerate the digital transformation journey, and also to identify the best partners, the best, ec the best ecosystems in which they can plug in to benefit for the progress and developments that others are, are, are making. And, and that's the main reason of why we have embarked at the forum together with, with, with your team in, in what we call the, the Global Smart Industry Readiness Index which is a new benchmarking tool that was successfully developed and deployed in Singapore. And that through the global platform that the forum provides, we are not trying to deploy it at global scale. Now, the belief is that if we are able to use one same and similar assessment framework to support and benchmark and help SMEs benchmark themselves and what they stand, we will be able to get access to a lot of unique insights that by devolving them, by sharing them back with the community, will help everyone identify best practices, share solutions, and once again, accelerate collectively what could become an amazing movement uh, on this global digital transformation journey that, that both MNC, SOEMs, and SMEs are embarking on. Thank you, Francisco. 
And thank you, Chris, for providing uh, the, uh, the framing, uh, as I call it, in terms of how we actually move forward and get into the next uh, level of, of driving scale and, and an impact. And so uh, we'll be coming back again through uh, the next few sections to, to dig deeper into these important topics. And on that note, I would like to hand it off to Carl March, uh, who will actually talk about the assessment tool uh, that Francisco just talked about. We've started using that. And he will be discussing this tool and, and the topic of technology and people and partnerships with Jill Mayer uh, from Beat Industries. So here you go, Carl. Thanks, Sudi. Uh, my name is Carl March and I'm a director for our Industry 4.0 program here at Stanley Black & Decker. I'm joined today by Jill Mayer, uh, CEO of Bead Industries, a small to medium-sized manufacturer located here in Connecticut. So Jill, it was just mentioned in the preceding segment that there is a suite of frameworks and tools available to assess manufacturers on their operational and technological maturity called Siri. And Siri stands for Smart Industry Readiness Index. Uh, what are your thoughts on that? How valuable would be an, ass uh, an assessment be for a small to medium sized manufacturer like yourself? I think it could be really valuable. Um, you know, what we need as a small business is a snapshot of our current technology landscape and an understanding of our future needs based on our plans for growth. Um, you know, we need to figure out the technology gaps that we have in our current structure and any efficiencies, inef inefficiencies. And we need to put together a structured plan for purchasing new technology and equipment. If Siri could help us with that and develop um, you know, a kind of a technology roadmap, I think it could be really impactful. So I'd be curious to, more, to learn more about the process for this. Sure, sure. So let me say a little bit more about what is involved. Um, today, we will offer to you the official Siri assessment or OSA for short. Um, it is designed as a robust technical evaluation tool with a healthy, healthy dose of pragmatism to provide that independent review for your manufacturing operations. Um, these reviews are conducted by certified assessors like myself, who are experienced industry practitioners well-versed in the methodology, as well as the complexities associated with the manufacturing environment in order to assess your facility accurately and objectively. The assessment process overall takes only um, roughly two days and begins with a, a, a one hour phone call. This call allows the assessor to better understand your company and together we, we would establish the assessment scope. Um, next, the assessor will visit your company or virtually visit to conduct a workshop with the relevant senior executives and survey your facility as well. Um, during this workshop, the key concepts behind Industry 4.0 will be shared with your team and the operations assessed across the three blocks of process, technology, and organization. And within those blocks, there are eight pillars and 16 dimensions, uh, which make up a pretty robust tool. And But this should take between one and one and a half days, depending on the size of the scope. And finally, the OSA ends with a half-day debrief uh, to review the findings and explore next steps. Um, at the end of it all, you will be provided with uh, uh, an official report, which includes the current state of your facility, uh, the prioritized areas for improvement, as well as your benchmark against your industry peers. So any thoughts on that? You know, sometimes the hardest thing for us is knowing where to start. So, um, you know, we don't always have the methodology for prioritizing technologies and moving towards the smart factory. And it feels like larger manufacturers um, are able to bring in consultants and, and smaller manufacturers don't have the funding for that. So our challenge has become new product development, identifying opportunities for growth, continuous improvement, um, employee recruitment. And I think we'll have a better chance of overcoming a lot of those challenges with an assessment like Siri. Well, um, I hope this is helpful um, to clarify one of the calls to action today, um, which is to invite more and more manufacturers to get their facilities assessed and get, their, um, get themselves started on their Industry 4.0 journey. Um, notwithstanding the typical challenges faced by the small to medium-sized manufacturer that you identified, Jill, 
there are three critical focus areas that amplify the impact of smart manufacturing. And those are talent, technology, and partnerships. And we'll explore all three of these in this next video and the panel discussion that will follow. To advance manufacturing, the entire industrial spectrum must uplift together. The large, the small, the newcomers, and those that have stood the test of time. Working together to create an ecosystem to enable and power the newest industrial revolution. And making the right investments in talent, technology, and partnerships. Talent is central and critical to create new capabilities for workers to forge new paths and solve problems in new ways and reach new levels of excellence at scale and speed. Transfer and democratization of knowledge with the ability to search and see how to do the work the right way is what's going to drive value for small and medium-sized enterprises, SMEs, and their workforce. By investing in the right technology to build a shared vision of Industry 4.0, it will set the foundation to fulfill a vision rooted in connectivity, automation, and intelligence. Connectivity to deliver the right data to the right people, to make the right decisions from the cloud, right to your dashboard, whether in the field or factory. A new type of automation that's more flexible, collaborative, and cost-effective for your factory. Made real through dynamic interactions with robots that are familiar and safe. And intelligence to uncover insights and drive action visually in ways never before seen. To show you where you're going and predict speed bumps and roadblocks that could stand in your way. And by building partnerships to create the right network that unlocks the right resources at the right time. From manufacturing associations to workforce and talent development programs, to share, learn, and grow. It's a vision within reach for all, with tools already at your fingertips. And it's just a click away, from the large to the small. We are in this together, to build and share our future ecosystem for those who make the world. We heard from Jim, Jay, uh, excuse me, from Jim, Jay, and Connecticut Governor Ned Lamont. And we heard about the power of Industry 4.0 and how it's helping SMEs excel, stay competitive, and bring high paying jobs. We also heard from Sudi, Chris, and Francisco on the size of the opportunity for SMEs and how we can utilize the World Economic Forum and the the overall ecosystem to transform. We heard from Carl and Jill on how we can get started by identifying where you are in the roadmap using the Siri assessment. And we just watched the video that talks about the critical components that are needed to transform. With that said, now we're ready to dive into another panel to discuss how we bring all of this to life. But before we get started, I wanna let you know that after the panel discussion, that's when we'll be answering your questions. And you're gonna to wanna to think about those questions as we go throughout the panel. Don't forget, you'll need, to be log you'll need to be logged in to submit those questions. So make sure that you do that now if you haven't already. If you have a question, just use that chat bar on the side of the screen. Let's get into it. With that said, I wanna welcome back Sudi Bangalore, CTO of Global Operations at Stanley Black & Decker to help us introduce the rest of our panelists and get started as we talk about the roadmap to data-driven manufacturing. Welcome back, Sudi. Thank you, Aaron. Warm greetings, everyone. Uh, glad to get into the details of how all of these things will come together. I'm sure coming from manufacturing, especially from an SME background, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm quite certain you're wanting to know uh, what the timeline for some of these things that you saw today would be. Uh, we would wanna know what the cost point is, the time to value, and of course, uh, the, the topic of talent and the upskilling and reskilling and the certification program that Governor Lamont talked about. So to answer all of these questions, I'm, I'm joined uh, by this terrific panel who bring a ton, not only tons of expertise, but a passion to also care and help scale, uh, as WEF say. So with that, what I'm gonna do uh, for the uh, sake of being uh, compact for time purposes, I'm gonna introduce the panel and then I will start posing some questions to them so they can get into the topic right away. So I wanna first introduce Colin Cooper, the manufacturing czar of Connecticut. 
Uh, again, Governor Lamont talked about this important position. He brings a tremendous amount of background as an SME himself, running a successful business in Connecticut, and now he's the manufacturing czar. And then we have Steve Ryan, uh, president of SIC, uh, which is a sensor company, innovation sensor solutions company. And he has worked for large companies, small companies, been in manufacturing all his life. And so he, he represents what technology means uh, what SME means to, uh, to companies like SIG, especially for the focus on innovation. And then we have, uh, obviously we have, we've already spoken with Jill Mayer and she will be part of the panel as well. And she will now take on the hat of how she as an SME and also as a president of manufacturing uh, CT, manufacturer CT, uh, will now leverage the ecosystem as well as help transform our, transform our own business. Last but not least, we've already heard from Chris uh, DiPentima, and so he'll be talking about how he, as the CEO uh, of CBIA, will help drive next steps and help get to uh, get to the next unlock that we've all heard about the last 20, 45 to 50 minutes. So with that, I'm going to jump right to Colin. Colin, if you don't mind, if you can elaborate on your background, I would like you to engage on on some of the key critical components that we talked about in the panel and the video, if you put on your SME hat, how much of, of that rings right with you? How would you want to comment on what needs to pri get prioritized first? And second part of my question is, you as the manufacturing czar, how will you actually engage on this very timely opportunity uh, to, to really leverage the ecosystem and take the already uh, set up eco, you know, set up partnership for the next level? Okay, well, uh, <clears throat> there's a lot to uh, unwrap there, but uh, um, yeah, I, you know, I spent 20 years uh, running and growing a manufacturing business uh, headquartered in Connecticut, and I think there are probably some people out there who would feel that the, you know, the government really, you know, the, the less role the government plays in manufacturing, the better. But you know, the fact of the matter is that government is involved in manufacturing uh, through, uh, you know, employment law. Uh, you know, regulatory, environmental regulation, health, financial safety, uh, and there's a litany of different government uh, government organizations that regulate manufacturing from uh, OSHA to EPA, the uh, Department of Public Health, et cetera. So, um, and, and there the government's really trying to uh, manage risk, but there's a role for the government to play in terms of providing vibrancy. I think, uh, you know, most people, um, uh, who are tuning in uh, have a lot of familiarity with uh, some of the programs that came through in the CARES Act uh, when, when uh, the pandemic sort of swept through uh, our country and our manufacturing sector. Uh, but there, there's a litany of other organizations out there helping provide support uh, and guidance for uh, manufacturing businesses, whether it's you know the SBA and their lending programs that are so vital to manufacturing or the Connecticut Small Business Development Center and the services they provide, uh, organizations like CONSTEP uh, on the consulting or CCAT on the uh, technology adoption side. Uh, and then there's the, the Manufacturing Innovation Fund that is a state-run fund that really focuses on supporting manufacturers. So, um, you know, th there's there are a lot of resources out there, um, but really you know, in terms of my role, uh, when I came on board, Initially, my focus was to try to identify the headwind issues for Connecticut manufacturers. I had a sort of a, uh, a sense of that from my own experience, uh, but wanted to see if there was a consensus out there, things around uh, things like, obviously, number one, is workforce development, uh, technology identification and adaption, access to capital, and whatnot. So for me, it, in my role, I'm really focused, uh, you know, uh, the last year has been pretty well consumed uh, with uh, issues in and around COVID. We're, we're moving past that now and looking forward, uh, you know, I've got a number of sort of uh, goals that are focused uh, tactically, you know, supporting the funding of the MIF, supporting the adoption of the uh, Workforce Strategic Plan, and then some more strategic goals in and around the, uh, the very critical topic today, the digital transformation of manufacturing, uh, and, uh, uh, you know, also supporting emerging industries through the state. There's a lot of 
really interesting things going on in different industries, particularly in and around green technology in Connecticut. So um, there's there's no shortages of ways to uh, to fill the day. Thank you, uh, thank you, Colin. And uh, we might come back to you with another question if time permits. And I'm sure the audience might have a few questions for you. Let me let me open up uh, the panel to them. So, Steve, I'm going to turn to you uh, as I as I introduced you as somebody who's been steeped in manufacturing for uh, for a long time. Can you uh, talk to uh, the role that SIC has played uh, in innovation, especially around manufacturing, of course, uh, and then specifically how how it would apply to the topic today of SNEs and with their own, uh, the big potential that they represent and also the constraints that they have, given that they're not a large corporation with access to all kinds of you know, uh, resources, et cetera. So can you speak to that? Before I, before I give, it, give it back to you, uh, give it to you, I would like to say that one of the reasons why I picked SIC as one of the companies to represent in this panel is if you really think about industry 4.0, it's one of the key critical components is data-led value. And data-led value happens when you actually censor your assets first, your process first. And SIC is a censor company. I've been so for a long, long, long time. So that's really sort of the reasoning behind why we have SIC. So with that, Steve, if you can just pick up and, and uh, pick up on that question and answer, that'd be great. Thank you, Sudi. And it's uh, an honor to be here today. Um, I must say data-led value is what it's about, as Sudi said. Uh, these are interesting days. There's a renaissance that's occurring in manufacturing and engineering. Um, it's a window of opportunity, the likes I've never seen in my career. And as Sudi said, I've been in, this, in, in, in manufacturing uh, my entire career. And I've seen technology advance. You mean your terms like digital transformation and in industry 4.0? At the end of the day, what's occurring is there's innovation that's occurring here. And it's, it's technology is coming from the plant floor in, in a way that it's never been seen. And in effect, what's providing is the ability to um, um, have a stepwise approach towards automation and information. Now, I may be using a lot of buzzwords, but let's simplify it. At the end of the day, you want to be able to uh, manufacture and operate, but there's a chance now to not just operate, but optimize. And uh, innovation, again, is, has brought an ability not have to install these large monolithic control systems, these big PLC systems or DCS systems, and you hear those acronyms, program logic world DCS. But now you can um, put in some sensors that are connected uh, right to the analytic uh, ability to get real time data and run your enterprise um, to address your KPIs and be more efficient than ever. Um, you, can, you can deploy a sensor. Uh, IOT environment or industry 4.0 environment infrastructure. And, and it's easy to get caught up in the big words and try and figure out what that means to your enterprise. I would suggest start at the basics. Uh, look at your enterprise. Where are the opportunities um, to provide value to your enterprise? Where can you be bottlenecked? Where can you provide uh, and mitigate more risk, uh, provide more safety? If you take a stepwise approach, put in a few sensors, connect it to the analytics, see the value. And there's a real ability today to do this. Um, so you also mentioned the contrast to an SME versus say a large enterprise. And I think there used to be days when it was the large enterprises that could invest in these large automation or information systems to get to that value. But it's different today. The technology, you can take sensing solutions, uh, smart sensor solutions and deploy them in, in, in have easy access to information like you've never had before. Um, the, the ability exists to uh, implement a couple sensors and uh, have that value of information to, to make real time decisions. In a matter of days, you could uh, I recommend making an assessment of your plant. That can be done in a matter of days. Take a stepwise approach in the key areas after you've developed a strategy of where to go, see that value, and then take another stepwise approach. So the idea is here is don't just operate your manufacturing facility, but optimize. It's never been better for SMEs today than to have the ability to bring in smart sensor solutions to help automate your, uh, your, your enterprises, see the value, see the information. 
um, data-driven manufacturing, key, key place here. I do want to say, uh, uh, again, I'm on in here to be uh, today from the city's perspective. One of the things that I find that's unique that, that, that we try and do from the city perspective is, is we have a lot of people who have been in these uh, manufacturing areas. We, uh, we, we try and get local with customers. We're there to not have you just take the technology and try and figure it out. But even with the small solutions to begin with, we're there with you in a consultative way uh, to help look at an application and provide value. The key is innovation. Though. The innovation has occurred. You'll hear buzzwords like artificial intelligence, deep learning. Yes, we, we embed some of these things in our uh, vision system that can improve uh, rejects uh, in, in scrap and increase your yields on, on manufacturing lines. They're proven solutions, and the technology is ready for that through innovation. That's the key. Absolutely. Thank you, Steve. Okay. Thank you so much. <laughs> so with that, I would like to uh, turn to Jill Mayer. Uh, for her perspectives, as I said, especially running a very successful uh, uh, SME organization herself, but also as uh, the president of the Manufacturer CT. So could you share your overall thoughts on, on the three critical pillars we're talking about today? What really resonates the most, uh, you running a business, and also as next steps, how, how could you help the larger ecosystem in Connecticut, Joe? Thanks, Judy. Um, you know, it's extremely important to leverage every available resource that um, that SMEs have. So whether that's through manufacturing associations like um, CBIA or NAM or WIM or Manufacturer CT, they all can help you navigate, you know, legislative issues, regulations, things that impact you. They can help you through workforce challenges. Um, some of them even have peer networks where you can share best practices with other manufacturers in your industry. And I would also recommend you know, partnerships with local tech schools, Bowtech schools and um, universities with makerspace labs. Um, you know, whether you're doing some prototyping with them or special projects or were you, or you're using them for a talent pipeline. So, um, you know, BEAD has relationships with, with all of those. And then the other thing is that rely more heavily on these partnerships. Um, the manufacturing ecosystem is a strong community where, um, there's tremendous, in my opinion, tremendous growth and opportunity. And what's starting to happen, it's nice to see, is that um, manufacturers are shifting their mindset to of joining the community from a nice to have to kind of a need to have. And I think it's pretty amazing because it's one of the ways that we can do more with less. Awesome. So uh, turning to Chris now, so you, you are obviously now the, uh, the representative for NAM in Connecticut, uh, Chris, and again with your own uh, background of, of being again a successful SME yourself. So how would you now connect the dots and and get to uh, the next two or three steps to the journey where you really can have and start building that flywheel effect, if you will? Yeah, thanks, Judy, for having me and for that question. So just to kind of touch on what Jill said and then get into some specifics. Relative to the next step, the, mini, the ecosystem here in Connecticut, the manufacturing ecosystem, is really robust. But at the same time, it has some complexities to it uh, that Colin and Jill touched on as well. So kind of one of the first steps for SMEs is navigating through the manufacturing ecosystem. And CBIA and our affiliate concept, that's kind of the role we play in a generalist way, if you will, Judy, is helping those SMEs navigate through the ecosystem, whether it's programs available at the state level or through various associations or just access to experts. And a more specific next step to the digital transformation, which we've been talking a lot, uh, a lot about in this program, uh, you know, while it's critical, and we touched on how critical the digital transformation is, it can be very, very challenging, especially for some of our smaller manufacturers. So we're fortunate, you know, at Concept that we have a variety of subject matter experts, whether it's in technology or operational methodology, quality, workforce. And we've worked with small and mid-sized manufacturers for over 25 years. So it puts us in a unique position to be a real incredible value uh, partner for these manufacturers. And as you and I talked about earlier, you know, I'm fortunate to have been in the SME world and I was a Concept client for over 20 years and experienced that value. So what does that mean specifically to the SMEs that are, are joining us today in technology? What Concept does is offer a holistic assessment of manufacturers that takes into consideration workforce and the operational workflow. When determining what technologies to maybe invest in, 
that can be sustainable for the long term for both the workflow and an employee's perspective because those are two critical things that need to be balanced when deciding technologies to enter as steve mentioned some of them uh, and even other technologies in industry 4.0 in addition concept as part of the manufacturing extension partnership or mep which is a national network we're lucky to be able to draw on the resources of over 50 other MEP centers throughout the country. And we tap into these resources when helping SMEs make smart technology decisions based on their operational needs, their business needs, and their technology goals. So Sudi, these are some of the very specific ways that CBIA through our affiliate concept can help enable the SMEs in taking the next step, which is the assessment of the company's individual transformation we talked a little bit about the Siri tool, which is a, it's a great new tool that is now part of our toolbox in helping SMEs assess digital technology. Yeah, we, we from SPD can't say enough good things about Constep. Carl March was on the panel uh, earlier. Uh, he, he is our point uh, with uh, Constep and they've done some great work already working with us and leveraging us. So I think it's, a, it's, it's probably the first step a lot of the SMEs and also the technology providers that are on this call. So uh, with that, Aaron, uh, do we uh, do we have questions from from the audience? Yeah, those are some great uh, responses there to those questions, and we have some coming in from the audience. Uh, our first question here is from Jay. Jay is wondering if you can tell us a little more about the digital skills credentialing program uh, that was mentioned earlier. So Colin, would you would you be able to answer that? Uh, probably not intelligently. Uh, <laughs> you know, I know there, there's a lot of work that's that's going on uh, through uh, the Office of uh, Wor Workforce Strategy, uh, Kelly Valerie's uh, group uh, on trying to in, in the credentialing area, uh, and, and certainly this is an area that uh, that we're looking at. Uh, we're also through uh, an initiative that we have with Department of Defense looking at workforce uh, development issues in and around digital technology and credentialing, but we're just really in the, in the early phases of that. So I, I can't uh, personally speak with, with uh, you know, a lot of knowledge on what's out there today. And I'm, I'm, I'm also assuming uh, a lot of the universities that are uh, both community colleges and universities in Connecticut are also involved in this initiative, right, Colin? Yes, uh, we, we're working on uh, this initiative, this specific initiative with Department of Defense, with UConn uh, and CCSU, as well as MXD, which is one of the National Manufacturing Institute, which has done a tremendous amount of work in and around uh, workforce development and taxonomy related to digital transformation. So. You know, we're still really in the early phases, even nationally, uh, sort of defining what the skills are needed uh, for this transformation, uh, then what the curriculum is that, that's built around that, and then what the credentialing is that's built around that curriculum. So there's a, there's a lot of work going on in that area right now. Excellent. Thank you. Aaron? See, we have a, the next question that we have coming in here, and if you guys have questions for us, go ahead and use that chat function on the side some of those questions and we're gonna try and get to as many as possible here with our time. Uh, the second question is, how is Stanley Block & Decker enabling your own suppliers? A wonderful question. So at about uh, six months ago, we, we decided that uh, we would actually start small. Uh, we selected a small uh, set of 10 SMEs that we want to engage uh, through our I4O and transformational program. And so what we have done is uh, we have, we've got a, uh, a, a lead uh, from our team, Carl March, who was on the panel earlier. And he essentially is working with these 10 suppliers to go through the, all, all of the steps that we've talked about, doing an assessment and then engaging on how we can actually enable, how we can actually support their transformation and drive productivity uh, and then we are providing both the consulting as well as in, in some cases technology uh, at, at no commercial uh, cost for these suppliers the whole idea here is how do we actually enable productivity through these suppliers and when they when they become more productive everybody wins so we're starting small to see how this program uh, will evolve and and uh, start helping our suppliers and, and therefore ourselves so more to come on that so we're pretty excited about this program but we surely have a dedicated structure 
And, and one last point I want to make is all of these SMEs, they also have a dedicated um, uh, SME, uh, meaning subject matter expert, uh, that is now engaging with Carl. So it's, it's off to a good start. Another question coming in here for you, Sudi, is uh, should Connecticut industry adopt uh, ISO 56000? I would uh, like to hand that off to uh, Chris. <laughs> I think it's company specific. So yeah, I'll take, I, you know, take a swing at it, but you know, whether Connecticut does it or the industry sector, it's, uh, you know, Colin talked a lot about the role of government and I think it's difficult to basically say, you need to do this, this is the only way to do something. And this is the great thing about what we've been talking about all day today. And, you know, Sudi, I don't think you gave Stanley Black & Decker enough credit in your in your last response, not only have you, Stanley Black and Decker, you are and Carl, uh, and everyone at Stanley engaged in Stanley Black and Decker supply chain. You deputize concepts to go out and do these assessments. You're going out to the broader Connecticut ecosystem, the entire SME supply chain here in Connecticut, whether they do business with Stanley Black and Decker or they're in another industry sector. So, you know, back to the specific question of ISL, just describing a specific tool for a specific industry or specific company is never a great way to go. Sometimes you get a square peg in a round hole of that. And that's why the assessment part is so critical. Don't prescribe the medicine until you diagnose the patient. And that's the critical part about the assessment and you know, in the series here as well. Great point. Fully agree with that. And on that note, you know, the other thing that I, I do want to point out is uh, as part of the uh, effort that, that we have ongoing with our suppliers, uh, we also have certain technologies that, that we have built on our own and we are actually offering that to our suppliers as well, again, on a trial basis. So if that offer is open uh, to kickstart this whole initiative, we'll do whatever it takes to get that, again, that flywheel effect. And that includes the technology we own. And so in other words, you know, where we don't have to license it from, from, from other uh, OEMs and, and players. So I uh, just wanted to point that out as well. Sudi, another question for you to uh, direct to the panel here is, Krista asks, pertaining to national and local Syrian industry 4.0, our company has manufacturing locations in other states. Can we get assessments for those facilities? Well, I, I can start first and Chris, and, and I'd like you to second that. And in this case, again, as, as Chris pointed out, uh, we are obviously all over the country, uh, all, operating you know, our operations are across the country so we would be i would think that the first step is start start with with uh constep engage in connecticut and if we need you know if, we, if this company if the smes needs help up across other states then we might be able to help uh, do assessments outside of connecticut did that make sense chris yeah, Sudi, I was going to say the same thing. You know, Connecticut was fortunate here to kind of be at the, at the front of the line, if you will, because of the great partnership with NAM and Stanley Black and Decker and CBI concept and having great people like Bill, Steve, and Colin. Um, but as I mentioned in my remarks and uh, the panel question, you know, concept is part of a larger national network, the MEC, the Manufacturing and Testing Partnership. So we, we will certainly be taking our learning from Stanley Black and Decker, our learning from what our interaction is with the SMEs in Connecticut as we go through the digital transformation assessment and sharing that with our partner MEP organizations across the country. And so if someone has a facility in another state, we can certainly, they can certainly talk to concept and talk about how we can maybe plug that other facility in. Absolutely. Question coming in from Ted here. Ted said, you shared some good examples for SMEs technology directions in new and more affordable sensing to data analysis. Are there others? Yes. Uh, I'll start that myself. Uh, there's several, so uh, including robotics, right? Not not robotics as you know, the, the the larger industrial robots, but robotics. I think there's tremendous progress that's been uh, made in robotics that makes uh, makes operate you know to set up the rope, the cobot and then to engage uh, a cobot working alongside a human and then be able to integrate it to let's just say a conveying mechanism. What would take maybe three to four weeks of design and programming now can be done in days, sometimes hours. So it's a, it's a, if you think about it, that alone represents a massive uh, savings of time and effort for an SME. Uh, so now to be able to, to lease a cobotic system, if you will, and then be able to prove something out in days and then be able to deploy, let's just say for only two to three months, that's pretty phenomenal. 
I don't think this would have been possible two years back or even a year and a half back. So this is this is fast evolving. All of these you know independent technology components that that's making uh, industry for all move forward. Um, Sudi, could I add to that, if, if I may, you know, th there's a lot of tools in the Industry 4.0 toolbox that are out there and available. And I go back to what Chris says, is one, one size doesn't fit all. And, and uh, you know, one of the things that if you're working with somebody like Constep, or you go into CCAT and see what they're doing is, you, you can get um, exposure to these different technologies, and particularly working with, with Constep's and some of the assessments that they do, uh, they, can, they can not only uh, identify um, what may be best for your business, but where you can get the largest return on investment. So uh, again, there, there's not a there's not one monolithic industry 4.0. There's a whole bunch of different tools. You talked about robotics, uh, artificial intelligence, virtual reality. Uh, there's a there's model based definition, which is which is something that's going to be key in the defense industry. Um, they're all there 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 are a plethora of different tools there. And most of us don't know what we don't know about these tools. And working with somebody like Constep or CCAT can get you that exposure, get you uh, that understanding of the technology, and then start to help you develop an understanding of how you can best deploy that in your business. And you know, I want to add another point to it. Somebody had a question about out of state, meaning out, out of Connecticut. So I think the, the template we're putting together um, a, a, a public company like SPD working with the state and, and, and SNEs across Connecticut, that whole that whole template. I'm so excited about the possibilities that it offers. Once we once we really uh, meld this model and start applying it and getting it to critical mass, we can do that very quickly. I think it has the awesome potential of now cutting this model and pasting it into multiple states across the country. I think it is very modular. It's very doable across the entire country. So I do, I do want to point that out, uh, that I think it is very, very possible to make that happen. All right, I see. Sudi, we've got, a, we've got time for a couple more questions here. Our next question coming in is, why is Stanley Black & Decker interested to promote SME's transformation? That's, that's a good question. So let me answer that uh, in, in three parts. One, uh, we're a very purposeful company. Uh, we want to be a force multiplier for doing good for the community, for the larger good, if you will. And so that is number one. And we're a manufacturing company. We're very proud to be a manufacturing company, local in Connecticut. So we, we believe manufacturing is an advantage for us, as opposed to a lot of companies the thought that have taken the posture that manufacturing may not be the thing to do, so therefore they do outsource whatever the whatever the options are. So for us, manufacturing is an advantage. Third, if you really think about the opportunity of Industry 4.0, there's only 30% of the industry that's participating in Industry 4.0 at scale, relatively speaking. So there's an awesome opportunity if we can actually generate more interest with events like this and get a larger momentum going with both SMEs and larger companies, then good things happen for the industry and we love that. So those are the three main reasons uh, why we believe in it. We're passionate about manufacturing and we have demonstrated that with the way we've set up the manufacturing, all of the other initiatives that our CEO is engaged as he mentioned in his opening remarks with Connecticut. It's been a great panel so far. We've got one, one final question here. Uh, for you coming in. This last question is, what new ethical issues do you see with Industry 4.0? Can you repeat that question again, Aaron? What new ethical issues do you see with Industry 4.0? Uh, the only thing I can think of, and I'll pass it on to the rest of the panel, uh, the only thing I can think of is uh, obviously data privacy. We don't really get too involved with data privacy and manufacturing, but there could be certain instances where there's some supplier information and so on that's that's in manufacturing. So we have to be really careful to make sure that uh, there's there's uh, all the governance and the securities in place uh, to make sure that there's uh, no uh, breach uh, along along those lines. That's the only thing I can think of. So so Chris, uh, Colin, Phil. Steve, any comments on that? <laughs> if I may, Sudi, um, 
Stick is a global company, and, and various countries have uh, um, regulations and restrictions on, uh, as Sudi just said, uh, private information. And, and so we need to be very conscious of protecting that in um, systems that provide information, in, in whether it's from the plant floor or information systems from other areas of the plant. And so we, we absolutely take that into account in our networking and security. And so it's, it's a good question. Um, let, let me add one other. I think some people have a concern that, uh, you know, automation is going to take over the world and put everybody out of a job. And, and I, you know, my personal belief is I don't see that in our lifetime. As we become more productive and more competitive here in Connecticut, we're going to have more opportunities. So uh, I see this as, as really supplementing, not replacing uh, the work we do. And, and candidly, the type of work that, that we're doing now in manufacturing is sort of higher order problem solving. Uh, you know, you hear the term new collar. It's becoming more uh, uh, more uh, cerebral than the old, uh, uh, you know, what people's perception is the old style manufacturing. So, um, you know, maybe that's a concern of some people, but but I see this as, as, as uh, certainly as revolutionary, but this is an evolution uh, and, and there's no risk of, of putting everybody out of a job, certainly not during uh, our, our professional lifetimes. I just want to second. I just want to second that. I mean, uh, every every operations that we have introduced, robotics, robotics, whatever the case may be, uh, the only thing that has happened is we we want to hire more people uh, because there's not enough people to hire, and and it, it drives it you know, it absolutely drives better competence, better uh, capabilities against your competition, and only good things happen. So I fully agree with what you're saying, Colin. I would third that the ability to upskill uh, the talent in manufacturing and um, the menial operations in, uh, that are repetitive and, and monotonous can be replaced with robots and, the, and, and such technology. But then the, the people that are in the plant, which are key to their knowledge, can upskill and truly uh, make decisions now on that data. Yep, exactly. Well, with that last question, we're going to close things out here in our panel. Thank you so much, panelists, uh, for this great discussion here on how SMEs can turn, can start putting their, their transformation into action. Now, we have a few final remarks for everyone that's watching at home. So I'm going to turn it back over to Chris Capentima to help us close out our Creators Wanted event today. I want to thank you all as well. Chris, it's all yours. <laughs>Industry 4.0 is the key to competitiveness in the future. Companies that do this right and do this now are going to be differentiated as we continue through this environment of rapid change, complexity, and volatility. Second, there are two important elements to Industry 4.0. The first is the technology that needs to be adopted. And the second is preparing people to implement it. The manufacturing workforce has been and will continue to be pivotal to our success. Third, now is the time, and there is a roadmap for doing this. Companies like Stanley Black & Decker, right here in Connecticut, have the experience with adopting Industry 4.0, and they are here to help. And you have the benefit of a fully functioning ecosystem of schools, credentialing, and nonprofits at the ready. To be clear, CBIA and our affiliate concept intend to take a leading role on this for our small and medium enterprises too. Stanley Black & Decker and Concept have generously offered to assess your companies on readiness as next steps for the transformation. And we will continue to partner with you so that we can help you fully assess the ecosystem of partners to enable the adoption of 4.0. Do not hesitate to contact us if interested or with any questions. CBIA and Concept are committed to producing additional programming specific to this transformation through 2021 and beyond. And Jim, thanks for your leadership and for Stanley Black & Decker's commitment to Connecticut and our manufacturing ecosystem. 
I turn it over to you. Thank you, Chris. Uh, indeed, success for manufacturing and success for manufacturing in Connecticut is dependent on partnership and collaboration. And I am pleased to offer our assistance in partnership with the NAM and others in the ecosystem. As Sudi Bangalore mentioned, we are looking forward to helping your companies take the first steps towards transformation in 2021. And our team is committed to assisting. This has been a really great session and we want to lock in some of the learnings that we've experienced, offer some of these learnings to other partners that weren't able to participate today. So with the help of Jay Timmons and his team at NAM, we are going to develop an ecosystem activation guide for SMEs. Our goal will be for the plan to be a useful guide for companies to follow, to access their ecosystem, to be prepared, to be leading US manufacturers and to prepare their people for the necessary change. Jay, we look forward to working with you and the team on this important follow-up so we can build on today's momentum. But first, let me thank you again for our long-term partnership. We are delighted to be able to continue to work with NAM on this and our other important initiatives to set the stage for interest development, success and inclusivity in manufacturing in the 2020s and beyond. Jay? You bet, Jim, and thank you so much for this decades-long partnership between the NAM and Stanley Black & Decker. And thanks, too, for the incredible leadership that you and Stanley Black & Decker have, have made for, for leading our sector uh, for so long and for encouraging more, more young people to get involved in our workforce. And Chris, thank you and your team at CB, CBIA for your incredible leadership and the work that you all do there. And also thanks to our panelists and everyone who's participated today. You know, advancing our industry toward manufacturing 4.0, it's going to require all hands on deck. That means government and business and nonprofits and educators. We all have to work together. And great companies like Stanley Black and Decker and everyone else involved in the Creators One Admission, well, they're helping us grow the workforce of the future. Right now, it's, it's so hard to believe, but manufacturers have 515,000 job openings. So when we say creators wanted, boy, do we mean it. The women and men who fill these positions, they're going to need an understanding of the digital smart technology that our industry is increasingly adopting. At the state level, advocacy from associations like the CVIA will be essential to bringing government on board and building the, building the digital infrastructure that our country needs we have to make the case for an historic investment in infrastructure because businesses of all sizes and their customers are gonna benefit from nationwide access to 5G. Now the NAM is here to help our members with resources to strengthen your company's digital transformation. Several resources, our Manufacturing Leadership Council for one, and also our Thought Leadership Series Leading Edge. And because remote work and the cloud present their own vulnerabilities, we also invite you to use the NAM cyber cover to help manage your risks and protect against cyber attacks as your company becomes increasingly digital. Oh, and, and by the way, don't forget to read The Power of Small. That's the NAM's weekly email newsletter. It's just full of resources and actionable intelligence for small and medium-sized companies. You're going to find it an incredibly valuable resource. Manufacturing 4.0, it's within reach for anyone. And I'm excited to see us come together to build the future of our industry. I sure hope you'll join us for future Creators Wanted events now. They're virtual for now, but we're looking forward to getting back on the road and doing it in person when it's safe to do so. Thanks, Jay. Once again, I wanna thank Jay, Jim, and Governor Lamont for being here, as well as all of our other great guests we had on the show today. And most importantly, we wanna thank all of you for joining us. I'm your host, Aaron Smalls, and until next time, we'll see you again on Creators Wanted.